Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and uh, I'm going to go back to a couple of things I did in my Friday night stream and basically lay them out with uh, some better quality videos. So this is all about my the smallest Duna lander I have managed to build. This is 26.3 tons at launch, and um, I understand that that's pretty low. <laughs> I'm sure that it's possible to do better, but right now, this is what I've got. And the secret to it, well, the secret to any low launch mass system is using jet engines initially, because jet engines are so ridiculously efficient in the in deep inside the atmosphere. And it's the first 14 kilometers or so of atmosphere that take most of your fuel on launch. After that, it's just a question of getting up to speed. So yeah, we've got a bunch of these attached to the side of my rocket, and um, they're going to carry us upwards. One of them is strapped over the um, the nuclear rocket in the middle. So once we get up high enough, we have to jettison it so that the nuclear rocket starts firing. And you'll see the actual thrust drops a little on that one because we drop it, but we in, in turn we get a couple of aero spikes. And after about 20 kilometers up, we drop the the jet engines and we're entirely flying on rocket power. Although it is a combination of high-tech chemical thrust and high-tech nuclear thrust. Uh, yep, once we get higher up, we run out of fuel in those external tanks and we are left with just the nuclear engine. Now, we're up at 43 kilometers. We're barely at orbital velocity and between it, we have two and a half tanks of fuel. And that will get us to Duna land and bring us back to Kerbin. You know, I think we can do even better than this. But yeah, on the first, on the way out, I was lucky. I picked the timing well and I got a, an intercept, a very simple intercept. So I brought that down, deorbited, you know, all the usual stuff. And unfortunately, the, the landing trajectory wasn't quite right. So I had to kind of shift it to the south a bit to make sure I, I hit this plane rather than the the hills. Uh, having seen, if you've seen my first attempt at Duna on with 0.17, you'll know that I don't land on hills very well. Thankfully, I have Mechanical Jeb here working for me. Also, you see that the nuclear rocket works at practically, it works about 80% efficiency, maybe higher than 80% efficiency even, uh, on the surface of, the, of Duna. So you get really good efficiency from that engine. It just has really tiny thrust. But it's enough to... Um, it's enough to handle this tiny rocket. Also note that the external tanks, you pretty much need to have those external tanks so that you can put the landing gear down because the nuclear rocket is so long. You don't actually need the ladder on the side because in Duna the gravity is low enough you can just EVA out. So yeah, also when you land, you pretty much have to wait like a hundred and something days before a carbon bit gets in the right position for the return. But yeah, we, we drop those off just as we escape the gravity or that we get escape velocity on Duna. But I couldn't manage to get a straight, simple return trajectory. I kept on missing. I literally tried this half a dozen times. So in the end, uh, I had plenty of fuels to spare in that middle tank. It is only a, a one-ton fuel tank, but it, all, it was enough for me to circularize my orbit and basically put me in a slightly lower orbit than Kerbin. And then uh, it was just a case of accelerating time and flying around and catching it up very, very slowly. And uh, yeah, this took some time, I'll tell you. It's 295 days when we finished circularizing our orbit. And you see, well... We have 74 fuel units left. So, I mean, this is why I'm saying we can probably improve on this because we have more, we had a good part of a tank left. So yeah, it took us another 250, 260 days before we finally got our Kerbin uh, sphere of influence. And at that point, it just took a tiny amount of fuel to put myself onto a, a landing trajectory. So here we go, just setting up a return. Yeah, 86 kilometers, that's not... Oh, no, sorry. 1,400 kilometers. Ah, what was that I saw there? So, yeah, just using up that fuel to bring me back down. Again, I think we could probably do a whole lot better. And if you can save, you know, one ton on the final stage, you could probably save at least five tons. So I would not be surprised if it is possible to build a Duna lander that is under 20 tons. Um... It might require very careful choice of your windows, but I uh, of your launch and land windows, but I think it's possible. 
And so, yeah, there we are, doing our re-entry. And uh, in time-accelerated mode, the thing spins around. But nonetheless, we drop the rest of the spacecraft and accidentally fire the parachute at 1.7 kilometers per second, which will probably be fatal in the final game. But until then, we shall enjoy the ride. And uh, yeah, so that's us. Um, as I said, I think I can do better, but I may not spend the time on it. So once we get down to the surface, it took us a total of 568 days, 500, almost 569 days. Um, not the shortest mission I've ever run. I really should use Protractor for calculating these orbital intercepts. They seem It seems to be slightly better, but... In this case, I was just stuck with Mech Jeb because I was lazy again. But yeah, what else did I do on Friday night? Well, on Friday night, I was also building a rocket car. So, now for something completely different. As Monty Python says. So yeah, you know, I was doing a lot of rocket cars on Minmus and on the runway, but it turns out there's a really nice flat area, and that's at the poles. And so here we go. This is using three solid rocket boosters, and it, it pulls a little to the left. I'll have to see that, tell the... check with the engineer about that. But otherwise, you know, it builds up speed nicely. Almost all that thrust is being used to counteract the force of gravity. The, but as the mass drops, the force of uh, air resistance drops because of the way the engine works right now. So I eventually top out at just over 520 and then immediately lose control, which is why I built in this awesome escape system. The, pa the pilot can eject once the car starts to spin out of control using these cool, um, the sepatrons to basically carry the capsule up, which is um, hairy to say the least and not always successful, but it's quite cool. <laughs> The parachute's deployed, and there is a piece of this vehicle left, but I'm not that interested in it. You know what I want to see? Let's see what it looks like inside the cockpit. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so just remember, 500 and something meters per second is getting close to what uh, the Bloodhound, the the thrust Bloodhound or whatever dudes, they're trying to go for a speed record. They're, they're going to be going for about, you know, half a kilometer per second if they can get it. I mean, they want to beat the magic thousand miles per hour, but they will they want to go faster if they can. So here we are getting close, and we this point in time we start to lose control just as we hit 500, but no problem. Fired out those RCS, uh, those Sepatrons, and we go flying. <laughs> it's not entirely stable, um... It's very easy to set this thing up in such a way that when you fire the Sepatrons, the capsule just spins out of control. But uh, I, I kind of like this as an escape system. It, feel, it feels real. Um, anyone remember the F-111? You know, instead of ejector seats on the F-111, they actually had like a whole escape pod that the pilot and co-pilot would be inside. I have no idea how many times it was actually used. I just remember seeing diagrams of this thing. I wonder if they could actually bail out of that as well. Anyway, yeah, this gets us back safely. And, um, yeah, what else did we do? Oh, yeah, so we, we tried this on the runway. Oh, there's our, there's the other thing. Yeah, so I was also trying this on the runway, and then I had this um, amusing thing happen. So, yeah, uh, the escape system didn't work quite as well as I in intended here. The separator did fire. The decoupler fired, but it was attached to the... the the, the force of the SRB kept it attached. So I, I figured I'd try bailing out. And then this happened. <laughs> Our brave test pilot um, separating out of there after bouncing. He, he hit the ground and there was an explosion. And next thing he knew, he, knew he was flying away at about a kilometer per second. Uh, s lost a lot of speed by the time I looked, but... That was uh, probably the fastest ejection I have ever seen in this game. Unfortunately, yes, he's not going to be able to survive this because landing on water, always fatal. 
Yes, there he is, firing his little RCS systems on his EVA suit, trying to sag on just a little longer, but to no avail. Seriously, not going to work. But you know, that is nothing, right? Well, let's, let's just take a look. Yeah, top speed 1.41 kilometers per second. That is nothing compared to Charlie Kerman, who has clearly been a very good boy, at least in the eyes of some higher being, because he was flying this uh, rocket, this SRB rocket, and, well, it was supposed to try and lift up a little, but uh, didn't quite work. And as we see, it starts heading towards the ground and he starts to worry about what's going to do. It's uh, flying at, you know, half a kilometer per second. So he jumps out, um, hoping that the gods will shine on him and luck will be with him. Because he knows that when you hit the ground at a shallow angle, you can survive. But no, he doesn't. But then something crazy happens. Apparently, the star child has looked upon Charlie and decided that this brave soul must be rescued. And so we follow the disembodied Charlie off away from the planet Kerbin at over 200 kilometers per second. Clearly, Charlie has reached the next level of existence and his essence is departing his home world at many times the escape velocity. I know we all thought that Charlie was special, but this shows just how special he is. Anyway, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.